Uh, let me welcome you all here. I'm Jeff Cowan. I'm the Dean of the Annenberg School. And one of the privileges of being Dean is that we've had so many wonderful faculty members join us uh, and bringing so many different talents. One of those who has brought terrific talent to the school is Casey Cole, who's been a famed science journalist, but much, much more than that. Uh, she's brought to her writing about science and then brought to, uh, to the rest of the world a uh, eclectic intelligence which shows the, which makes science accessible, but also shows how everything in the world is connected. And so she started doing a series called Categorically Not at another venue. And when Casey joined us as a member of the journalism faculty, she agreed to make Categorically Not a part of the activities of this school. I think you're all in, we're all in for a wonderful treat when we hear this talk by the terrific Casey Cole. Casey, thank you. Are you mic? Your mic, sir. I'm mic? Yeah, you're mic. Can I be heard? I have a really soft voice sometimes, so if you can't hear me, please say so. Um, categorically not, by the way, the origin of that is an artist friend of mine who used to say, the worst disease afflicting humankind is hardening of the, ca of the categories hardening of the categories, putting things in boxes. Um, so I, I, guess, I guess I just want to start by, um, I want to tell you a little bit about what this is about in general. So the best way I'm going to do that is to actually read to you just a little bit from this crazy proposal we submitted to SC. And I thought, there's no way that this program could come to this university. So one of the most delightful things was to learn that it, it could, and it showed me that I, I definitely came to the right place. <laughs> um, so my me mentor, who is a physicist, Frank Oppenheimer, who founded the Exploratorium, if any of you have been there, and um, he really integrated science, art, politics, culture all the time. But the, one of the nicest things he used to say was that artists and scientists are the official noticers of society. That they're people who notice things that other people either have learned to, who have never learned to see or have learned to ignore, and then communicate those insights to the public. Well, that's exactly what journalists do too. They're noticers, and then they're communicators of, of what they notice. So here, here's what we wrote, and the only reason I'm reading it to you is because I thought, wow, this is better than anything I could say, because we were trying to get accepted. But what we said was, the search for truth is a quintessentially human pursuit and also the prime business of universities. And yet artistic, humanistic, and journalism, journalistic truths have become so segregated that students, like the public at large, have come to see them as disconnected and often irrelevant to each other. Students identify themselves as belonging to one tribe or another and soon become intimidated or disinterested or both in finding out what the others have to offer. But in fact, the most productive kinds of truth seeking, as well as the most interesting, draw from all disciplines and ultimately inform them as well. Playwrights, poets, painters, philosophers, filmmakers, novelists, musicians, choreographers, and journalists all have mind the physical universe for insights into the nature of everything from love to social movements to God. Scientists, on the other hand, rely on aesthetics as much as they do on logic. And their work takes place in a cultural and artistic context. It's no coincidence that cubism, quantum theory, and James Joyce emerged during the same period of time. Both cosmologists and theologians study the origin of the universe. Sound decision-making relies on aesthetics as well. Ethicists, physicists, and composers all care about what is ugly and what is beautiful in behavior as well as in um, equations or, or in music. It, it, but it would be so easy for an undergraduate to go through four years here and not know that physics is natural philosophy and that our very notions of what's right and what's wrong, of human nature and human potential, of fairness and progress, 
are deeply embedded in our beliefs about how the physical universe works. For example, the same principles of symmetry that underlie Einstein's relativity is also the thought behind the golden rule, do unto others as others should do unto you. If you switch the doer and the dewey, you have a symmetry, which is exactly what both special and general relativity is all about. So the connections are really, really strong. So it's not only, though, that people miss out on the pleasures of exploring these links. Um, very significant insults result. One of my really uh, uh, striking moments I had was I was interviewing a mathematician who, uh, her name is Ingrid Dobchi at Princeton, and she's a MacArthur genius fellow. And, she was telling me what she really liked about being a MacArthur Fellow, and it was that she got to meet a poet at one of their parties. And she said she realized, finally, what math was, that it was exactly the same as poetry, that it was a distillation of a complicated world into a simple way that could be communicated well. So the, the final thing I want to say is, uh, that we wrote in here, and this is where I was sure we were going to get turned down. Because, as I'll show you, the programs that we did before were um, extremely informal. Nothing rehearsed, n n nothing. I, we, we don't know what's going to happen. That's part of the ser serendipity. And uh, it, it really had amazing results. But what we want to encourage is risk taking on the part of both prevent presenters and audience. So people cannot give a canned talk. It's impossible in these venues. And we really, really um, wanted to keep that when we came to SC. And I was very worried about it. We had an auditorium for the first one that was, it was full. There were people in the aisles. There were people, in the, I, I was amazed. I thought this, is, this will never work in a university venue. Um, but it did, but it did. So this play is so important. It, it's probably impossible to, it, to, to overstate the importance of play. And it's something we don't value. Um, it's not what we teach our students to do. We teach them to follow rules. And I mean, journalism is about breaking rules, in my opinion. So they need to be prepared to fall on their faces and fail. And that's what play is. Play is trying something just for the heck of it, knowing full well that you may fall on your face. But that, that's better. I think this was a Thurber quote, quote, that it's always better to fall on your face than to lean so far over backward that you fall that way. Um, so it's really, really important. Um, I, I wanted to, how many of you were at yesterday's lunchtime talk with the dean? And Well, it was just interesting. Two things came up that, there was a lot of talk about the dumbing down of newspapers. And um, this is so true. And uh, he, Michael didn't mention that the, the science in the LA Times has all but disappeared. Why? Well, it's because editors are risk averse. They don't want to take chances. They think their audience is dumb, and they treat them that way. But it's mainly because they don't want to feel stupid if they don't understand things. So they're. So it's, it's all, oh no, we shouldn't say that because of this. But the other thing that, that I thought was interesting, someone said that um, they read the New York Times. First of all, they're saying everybody reads the New York Times. Of course, that's not true. Not in LA, most people. The, yeah, a certain level does, but most people read the LA Times. But he said he didn't read the LA Times anymore because um, because there were cartoons in it. And I thought, wait a minute, some of our most astute political commentators these days are cartoonists. And those editorial cartoons which have been disappearing are very sharp and incisive. I mean, they're obvious people like Gary Trudeau, but there are, there are lots of lo lots of others. In fact, we lost at the LA Times, we lost Sylvia. Um, which was a great comic strip, which was very, very incisive about political movement. So that's the introduction. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a very fast slideshow about the origins of this thing. And then I'm going to try to show you little clips from the program we actually did here, which was 
phenomenal. So we are categorically not science serendipity because PowerPoint, somebody said power corrupts, PowerPoint corrupts, absolutely. And I think, I think, that, I think that's a true statement. Okay, so the origins are, I have a book coming out, the subject is nothing. I meet the owner of the Cornelia Street Cafe in New York, which is a wonderful venue, the Vagina Monologues uh, premiered there, and John Lennon used to hang out. So it's really a New York institution. And, um, and what, what happened was that, I'm gonna go back for just a second. What happened is that, that the, the owner of that cafe said to me, you're not famous enough. So, in the meantime, I had been corresponding with this guy, Rolf Hoffman, who is a Nobel laureate, and, um, you know, I thought he was kind of a serious guy, but we had this long correspondence, and during it, we actually, I wanted him to come to Wesleyan University, where I was teaching at the time, because I couldn't find anybody else who could talk about, talk about chemistry. But, you know, I thought he was a kind of a serious guy, and then I began to realize that he probably wasn't, and when I asked him to send me a photograph, this is what I got, but this isn't the half of it. He went to Brazil and danced in the carnival parade, dressed up as just this bizarre creature to promote the idea of science in carnival, which, you know, is just a bacchanalia. It's just all about sex and booze. But, um, <laughs> but he thought it was serious. He thought any venue where we can push science. So Rald was my kind of guy, and he finally came to Wesleyan, and the program we did, which attracted really the whole campus, it was amazing. We had 12 departments, um, women's studies, mathematics, English, theater, physics, you name it, they were there. And the title was Metaphor in Science and Art with Rald Hoffman, Molecular Mimicry, Rachel and Leah, the Israeli Male, and the Inescapable Use of Metaphor in Science. And I thought, this is my kind of guy. I really liked him. So. We had our New York debut. The way we did it was, because when I told the owner, well, I have a, no a laureate, you know, he writes books and plays, that should be, he said, not famous enough. So we got Oliver Sacks, who we both knew from different venues. Well, he was famous enough. And when we opened, um, we had 300 people <laughs> lined around the street. So um, this is entertaining science. It goes on the first Sunday of every month, pretty much. If you want a, a link, uh, go to the Categorically Not website, which I'll show you, and there's a link to it, and we'll tell you. Th this uh, month they're doing, um, oh, they're doing old wine, old wine, and they have a bunch of chemists who've managed to recreate 2,000-year-old wine. And then, they, of course, they have people playing wine glass music and some dancers doing something or other. So it's, it's a cabaret. It's a cabaret. It's a performance space. But then I was in LA and I had all these, you know, ideas and I couldn't do them all in New York. I can't get to New York that often. So I was at a party and I met this woman who's Sherry Frumkin. She runs an art gallery here and I was talking to her about what I like to do and she said, oh, well, we've just turned an airplane hangar at Santa Monica Airport into 28 artist studios in a gallery and why don't you do it at our place? I thought, wow, that was easy. The reason I like to tell these stories is one of the hardest points I have getting across to students is, yes, you can do it. I mean, it is amazing what you can do if you just ask. And you just, if, if you risk re rejection, go for the crazy ideas. In my career, I can't tell you how many times the nuttiest stuff has happened that way. And the, this is my friend, Rald, you can see. Um, he came out to do a program on mixtures and being in Brazil and chemical mi mixtures and, and so forth. And so that's Yossi uh, Govrin, who is the co-owner. And uh, the, this is some of his work. It's just wonderful because you're, you're surrounded by art. Um, and this is the, these are the announcements. So we worked hard. We kind of came across, we got this name, categorically not. And, and the beginning of the, um, the announcements they always send out are starting with Bob Miller's quote and then, you know, that pretty well sums up the sentiments behind categorically not an occasional series of Sunday evenings dedicated to exploring the common ground of art, science, politics, and whatnot. And on it goes. So the first program we did was on holes. That is, I know you can't see these, so, so I'm just going to tell you quickly. This is Andrea Gez from UCLA. 
She uh, weighed the black hole in the center of the galaxy. She gave a great talk. Then we had a French horn player who, uh, who it, you know, it's a 12 foot hole. And she took it apart and she talked about the history and she played and, and then we had, um, I don't have, I just have the pictures that Yossi sent me, so they're, they're not great. But the third person did a scene from Beckett's Happy Days where the protagonist, Winnie, is up to her neck in a hole. So that was pretty much fun. We did string, strings. Um, this is Clifford Johnson, who you'll see more of a, in a minute. He's, um, he's a, a very prominent string theorist who's here at SC in the physics department. He talked about string theory. And then we had someone from the Bach Society who talk, talked about tempering strings and just played fantastic music. And so that, this is Clifford. So the, one of the real serendipities was that I got to know Clifford Johnson, who came to the first one from Halls and, and never didn't come. And he brought projectors, because most of the time people don't have projectors, the gallery doesn't have projectors. So this was really an all volunteer, all volunteer effort, sorry. Um, <laughs> More good luck was that this random guy who is, who's miking Carolyn C. showed up and said, how'd you like a sound system? Nobody could hear. So he brings in a sound system for nothing. Everybody, nobody gets paid. It's just totally volunteer. Um, <laughs> these are two uh, SC professors. One time we had, we, we had a lot of UCLA people too. And, and one of the neuroscientists we had in a program on mirroring in which we had an artist who used reflections and we had neuro neuroscientists who deal with something called mirror neurons, which are really interesting. Oh, and Jack Miles, who Pulitzer Prize winner, et cetera, um, who writes about God. He talks about how we mirror ourselves in God. So that, that was a pretty interesting program. But you know, people get together and try. Anyway, the neuroscientist from UCLA says, well, how many people here are from SC and how many are from UCLA? <laughs> and he was really, angry when it turned out that there were more from uh, SC. So for example, uh, you know, a re I mean, <laughs> stupid. This is um, Domer, who's a wonderful professor here. She almost always comes. And this is a program we did on intuition. So this is Judd Dannenbaum in the, in the film department, who talked about intuition and filmmaking. The fellow over there is probably now SC's most famous prize, Antonio Damasio. He's very famous, a neuroscientist. He talked about what goes on in your mind when you experience intuition, neuroscience. And this guy, who's not from SC, I tried to get the SC people. But um, this was really interesting. This is a guy named Joel Polchinski, who had just been uh, elected to the National Academy of Science. He's also a string theorist. And he was nervous about what he was going to say. We had a conversation. And it was amazing, because what we talked about was how do you intuit reality from equations? How do you go from an equation to, to an idea, to a thought? How do you see? I mean, he was the one who discovered these sort of brain, brain worlds, um, which are that you know, we live on basically the, the three-dimensional universe that we live on is really this membrane like this, and everything is caught on it except gravity, which can leak off because gravity is everything. Um, is space time. So you can't get away from gravity no matter where you go, no matter what you do, you can't get away from gravity. So it was just really a fascinating program. And then we did space and we had a physicist who was an extra dimensional space guy. But then we had Margot Apostolos, who was the direct head of the dance department here. And she gave this wonderful talk about how she'd actually solved the problem at NASA with a space shuttle arm because she studied robotics. She, she does a lot of that. But as a dancer, she had, she had a different way of thinking about movement. And so that was really cool. And the other guy who you can't see is Michael Deere, who's a geographer, also at SC. So this thing was getting really heavily SC. Um, here's a, another young physicist, Stephen Haas, who did this program on resistance, which was amazing. We had. The, the head of the Center for Political Graphics here, who did a presentation on how art can stop wars. Um, don't remember what the other one was. But 
uh, Stephen studies resistance in materials and uh, how to get rid of it, do superconductors and things like that. But he's also a wonderful musician, and he brought his friends from the early music group at SC, and they played, they brought in these ancient um, lutes and, uh, re and recorders, but, but some of them were 12 feet long, and they, the music was astonishing, really just astonishing. Can't remember who the third person was, but it doesn't matter. Um, Amy Bender, who's a wonderful writer, who's in the English department here. We did a program on reality and illusion. We had a neuroscientist talking about optical illusions and an artist who, um, who worked in that as well. Another thing that, that became useful was there's a, a, a group centered here at SC called the Los Angeles Institute for Humanities. So I met this guy, Robert Winters, uh, at UCLA, who's just a phenomenal m musician. And, and the theme was attraction. So he talked about how, how, mu how music, both in its subject but in its composition, deals a lot with attracting you someplace or so someone else. But it, but, but it was an amazing program because we had, we had two chemists from UCLA, a husband and wife team, and they, they, you know, they played, they had experiments, they played with Cheerios, they did all kinds of stuff. And then, um, oh, we had an actress who did scenes, I mean, she read John Donne, she did scenes from Richard III, she did scenes from Mammoth, I mean, it was just amazing. But what was really serendipitous was the guy whose painting is in the background, totally by chance, was someone I had tried to get to do attraction, but he was too busy, he was having a show at the Getty and blah, blah, blah. Well, his work happened to be up and he happened to be there. So he got up and talked about his stuff. Sometimes we get Caltech, this cosmologist from Caltech with Carolyn C. This was a program on the apocalypse, the end of the universe, um, also about revelation. We had a religious person talk about the book of Revelation. Cornell, that's when Rald came out to do mixtures, and we had a whole group of Brazilian capoeira dancers who were gonna talk, and they never showed up. But, you know, they were Brazilian, so I went, all right, you know. Um, this is Clifford, so this was very important. Clifford did our website, uh, just again, volunteer, brought the projectors, brought the website. So it was Clifford's idea to apply for this proposal to do it at SC. I thought he was out of his mind. I thought there was no way it was going to translate. But here we are, we're part of Visions and Voices. This is our next one. Um, and here are two coming attractions. This is uh, Uncertainty 2. The first, the one I'm going to show you was Uncertainty. This is second, this is Larry Pryor, teaches at the journalism school, going to talk about uncertainty and global warming and why students have a problem dealing with uncertainty. Um, Veronica. Krauss is a composer. She's at the Thornton School. So we're very, and, and this guy, Farzad, whose name I can't pronounce, is an alum, and he did the structural engineering on Disney Hall. So that's gonna be fun. That's the next one. And then we have Point of View, which we also did at the studio. Amy Parrish is in the Anthropology and Women's Studies Department, and just does the most amazing lecture about bonobos, who, these crazy chimps who are probably our closest ancestors. But mainly she shows how male and female scientists looked at the same data and came to completely different conclusions. Um, John Borston used to teach film here. He, he talks about point of view in filmmaking, camera ankles, and uh, that's Victor Navasky, um, who's an old friend. Uh, he was the publisher of The Nation, and he feels very strongly that journalism should be opinionated, that this whole thing about being objective is, is bad. And I agree with him, but don't tell anyone I said that. <laughs> okay, that's it. We can turn that off. Oh, okay, I gotta get through this really quickly because I wanna get your questions. I mean, it's only 30, oh, 33 after, okay. so. This is how we started the physics part. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not showing you any of my introduction. This guy. No, I'm just gonna say, 
because later when I listened to it, I realized it made absolutely no sense. I'd cut out all the transitions to make it short enough, and it was the worst talk I ever gave in my life. But so this is the first. They got this guy in Germany, Fritz something or other. Where is it? Maybe it's Werner. Anyway, he's got this theory. You want to test something, you know, scientifically. How the planets go around the sun, what sunspots are made of, why the water comes out of the tap. Well, you got to look at it. But sometimes you look at it, your looking changes it. You can't know the reality of what happened or what would have happened if you hadn't have stuck in your own goddamn schnoz. So there is no what happened. Looking at something changes it. We call it the uncertainty principle. I'm sure it sounds screwy, but even Einstein says the guy's onto something. The, the, the program was about uncertainty. So we started with physics. I talked about the physics of the uncertainty principle, and then, OK, we showed bits of this clip. Oh, oh OK, that's, that's fine. So, um, so I gave an introduction, and then I introduced Clifford Johnson, our USC uh, SC physicist. And then we had a little bit of a conversation about uncertainty in physics, mainly about the uncertainty principle and how it played out. Oh, this is too bad. Oh, I see they have to fast forward. Uh, OK. What, I'm, what I tried to do was pick out little snippets that were the. Uh, and you can arrive to a lot of the properties of the uncertainty principle that way. But it's actually a lot deeper than that. It really is saying, fundamentally, there's something about space and time which, um, on, on big scales, we think are uh, one way, which is that we can arbitrarily specify uh, information. Um, uh, we, can, we can know arbitrarily well the properties, say, of a particle at a particular point and its, uh, its position and its momentum, as Casey was talking about. So um, that's very true in the real world, the big world, as it were. But actually, when you get down to uh, the scales of uh, where quantum mechanics is relevant, you find that space and time really aren't like that. Uh, they're fundamentally different. And that's what uh, the uncertainty principle is saying. Um, so what I thought was, I, I, I may have cut it off too soon, was at the end the guy behind the bar says, you know, this guy, uh, Werner, <laughs> Heisenberg. I actually got a pretty big laugh when he called him, I, I don't know, something, Walter. Uh, but he says that uh, it, the last thing he, the guy says is, and this guy, you know, he actually put this stuff into equation. So I just introduced Clifford as, that's what he does. He puts his stuff into equation. So I think we're now going to the end of um, Clifford. So Clifford and I were talking about various aspects of the uncertainty principle. And I think the last question I asked him had to do with how it plays out in his own work, how it comes into his own work on something called string theory, which tries to unite Einstein's theory of general relativity, curved space time, which is smooth, and the quantum world is all torn up um, and jittery. So. String theory is one aspect of it which is very important is the fact that it somehow manages to combine um, quantum mechanics and gravity. And so one of the things Einstein taught us in, in 1915 is that gravity is really just the ability of space and time to, to change its shape, to, to get warped. You may have heard that in Star Trek or things like that. Um, and uh, so warping of space-time is, is a real thing that, that actually happens. Uh, and I always like to mention at this point that um, you use it every time you, you fly in an airline, um, on an airliner. Pilots use general relativity to guide 
uh, flights. If you have a GPS system in your car, you're using what they use, that uses general relativity. That warping of space-time is really real. And uh, so we know it happens, it's a real thing. And then we know this other lesson about quantum mechanic, about space-time is this quantum mechanics thing. And uh, so quantum mechanics introduces this uncertainty, this ability of things to uh, perhaps do things that we hadn't expected they would do from classical physics. And string theory combines the two. So one of the things we expect is that when we get the right description, we will see space and time doing uncertain things at a very small scale, perhaps at the very earliest uh, time of, of the universe's creation. Okay, now we're, now we're switching uh, gears. Actually, um, what, what string theory does is it substitutes for point particles little loops of string and so, uh, some fundamental stuff that vibrates in 10-dimensional space. Why are people so excited about it? If you don't have that and you have these point particles and you get uncertainty, in, in space-time, you, you at some point you rip apart space-time. So before can come after, after, and, and time makes no sense. I mean, space breaking down, who cares? It's not a big deal. But when you mess with time, you've really got a problem. And so these little loops of whatever, space, topology of the vacuum, you know, um, they make that. Uh, go away. You never get small enough to rip apart the fabric of space-time. But it's very controversial. And uh, just let me know when you're ready. Um, it's very controversial, and lately there have been a lot of articles and reviews about two new books that came out, uh, in one very nasty one in The New Yorker, some in USA Today. But I have to tell you, that the two science writers I know who actually know a thing or two about physics, that would be Tom Siegfried, who wrote the review in the New York Times, and of course myself, duh. Um, and my review comes out on Sunday in the Times book review, and I expect to get lots of hate mail. Okay. Now many of us in this uh, community, in this world, uh, it, it celebrate and embrace that freedom to choose. You know, I, my wife and I once took a Buddhist meditation class. We're, we're Jewish. We're practicing Jews. That makes us boo Jews. <laughs> That's okay in my value system to be a boo Jew. So this is Jonathan Kirsch, who is a, a lawyer and a, a, in publishing and writes reviews and has written seven books, I think, on 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 religion and culture, and um, very interesting talk, because Jonathan is a practicing Jew. I've been to Seder's at his house. They take it quite seriously. But he really doesn't care for God much. <laughs> I mean, he's got a very eclectic view. He, he really, really thinks that the idea of monotheism uh, held to so strictly, you must worship this religion and no others in this particular way, or we will kill you at the extreme is, is where it goes to. So this was his book that he was talking about. Um, it's called God Against the Gods, The War Between Monotheism and Polytheism. But the, he also talks a lot about how even what we think is definite in the Bible is not. Okay. The irony is that this theological uncertainty principle that I have uh, argued to you is the, is the core value of paganism, in fact, permeates monotheism as well. And if you read your Bible with open eyes, you'll see it in plain sight. Uh, the, the theological uncertainty principle, the wave particle duality, is right in our scripture. You know, we may say, uh, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one. But in fact, there are many different uh, personalities and characteristics uh, attributed to God in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, in the story of creation, our creation myth, uh, God doesn't sing the world into existence, but at one point he kind of thinks it into existence, let there be light, He's just kind of conjuring it up in his imagination, and there was light. And that in one version of the creation story, by the way, if you read your Bible carefully, there are two. In one version, he thinks human beings into existence. And then flash forward a few pages later in your Bible, 
Uh, God is kind of a, a, an old man, a sculptor. He hunkers down into the muck of creation. He takes mud into his hands. Isn't that interesting? God has hands. In the first version, God was all mind. God was a vapor. But now God has hands. And he molds that clay into the first man, into Adam. And what does he do? OK. So finally, the third part of this evening, which, was, which really just brought the house down, is a wonderful actress. I hadn't even known her. It was totally risk-taking. But um, when I talked about what she might do, she had the idea of doing Abbott and Costello's Who's on First routine as an example of what uncertainty in language can do. But the first thing she did was she wrote this piece uh, about, it was really about sadness. It, it got to be about sadness and hope. And, and, and people just would not stop applauding. It, it, everybody wanted a copy of it. It was phenomenal. And then, of course, she went into Abbott and Costello. So uh, w it, with her beat, her hook kind of hippie friends, not, not hippie. Um, before, the beat generation, I mean, very much of the 50s instead of. So there are just two more quick clips, and then I'm totally done, and I really want to hear what you have to say. I'm here as, a, as an actor, you know, and our job is to turn words into human emotion. And that's as a word and an emotion is, seems as, as different as a wave and a particle. And I feel, and I, I, I think that I'm lucky that I didn't know the true nature of what I was getting into when I started out to be an artist, especially to be an actor, because you have to become fully human. I mean, the art is to bring life to characters who are people, and people are human. And um, I was not really interested in being a human among humans. Chloe's basic point in the beginning was that the great thing about acting was you always knew what the end was going to be. You always knew what was going to happen. You had the script. But it turned out that that didn't work in real life. It was not like that. And it was much, much more difficult to be human than than to act, and it was, and she goes into a lot of pretty m sad and moving stuff about her personal life. She, her, um, well, her point was to make people really happy and then really sad and then really happy inside, so they would feel it. So this is the end of her talk. Hey, and I didn't want to have to be myself to do it. Oh, acting. I, okay, that was just a little middle. By the way, the wave-particle duality that everybody talks about, I forgot to mention, that's just an essential part of, of quantum theory and uncertainty. That, and every particle has a wave-like nature, and every wave, like light, light is a wave, but it's also a particle. So that is the duality that is really very, very important in, uh, in physics. Uh, what else can I tell you? Chloe was, um, she starred in Sid and Nancy. She played the girlfriend of Sid Vicious. Uh, uh, just an amazing performance. She was just drugged out, you know, living on the street. So when she walked in and I met her, I thought, well, who is this? Because <laughs> she looked and talked and, and was, oh, okay, good, let's go. And then I thought, only a suicide has absolute certainty that for them there is no hope. What relentless force does that weak word represent? There's so many poems about it. Hope springs eternal. Where there's life, there's hope. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. See, I think 
that my old fear of feeling fully human was, was this fear of really falling for it, hope. You know, that, that, that the whistle in the dark, the watery tinkle of remote possibilities was actually the overture to another crushing disappointment, which of course, it has been, but not every time. So tonight, anyway, I wonder, I wonder if hope is the unfathomable soul music that is the seed of every artistic impulse and, and possibly even the unnameable substance of the endlessly recombinant creative universe. It's the first thing you hear in the morning. It's the last thing you hear at night, in the woods, in the swamps, in the old steeple, in the ruined eaves over the wreckage of the car your mother drove straight into a wall. The bird won't stop singing. It's perched in the ashes of a house that burned to the ground. Wherever you move, it's one hop ahead of you, tireless as a creek. It's a tune that will not allow itself to be forgotten. It keeps building and leaving its nest, all chatter, all expectation, water singing to itself in the shadows as well as in the sunlight that insufferable optimist. No matter how many doors you slam, curses you shout, rocks you throw, it pipes up louder than ever on this very branch of this very tree outside your house, as if stones were your way of applauding. It was singing the morning you got fired the day you brought grief to the person you most wanted to protect, the evening that great cause you pledged yourself to failed. It sang while your father was writing his suicide note, the night your dear friend told you her cancer came back and it spread, the night you could find nothing remaining to believe in when all you wanted was to be left alone. It sings in places so dark you can't see into them. It's out there. It's out there singing now. Okay, last piece is just the very beginning of Who's On First to show you what an amazing actress she is. She's on everything. She's on Two and a Half Men. She's on ER. She's on, I don't know, there's a whole list. She's everywhere. She's doing theater and movies. And um, I, actors just amaze me, I, it, how they become someone. I never had much respect for actors until I got to know them. Here, there's a great theater community in LA of small theaters. And I've seen so many of my friends just change. OK. Um, in order to demonstrate the uncertainty of human communication, we will perform the classic comic routine, Who's On First? <laughs> Done in the vernacular of the hip. Take me out to the ball game. <laughs> hey, Dig, I, I took a gig managing a B minor baseball team. Oh, I love baseball. You got to tell the, me the guys' names on the team. So when I go to the ballpark, I will know those fellows. Cool, cool. But <laughs> check it out. These days, they give these ball players some very crazy names. Crazy names? Nicknames, pet names, 
Now we have who's on first, what's on second, I don't know who's on third. So that's what I want to find out. I want you to tell me the names of the fellows on the team. I'm telling you. Who's on first, what's on second, I don't know who's on third. Hey, hey, you know the names of the fellows on the team? Yes. All right, then who's playing first? Yes. I mean the fellow's name on first base. Who? The cat. Playing first base. Who? The guy on first base. Who is on first? Well, what are you asking me for? I'm not asking you. <laughs> okay, that's it. Um, I, I, I'm sorry that went longer than I thought it would, but I wanted to try to capture the essence of, of what that evening was like here. And it was um, just really very, very rewarding. It was a wonderful group, lots of students, young, old, graduate students, provosts and deans and, you know, just regular people off the street. So I would love to um, take any questions that people have about any of this. Or not. Uh, I have a microphone, so. Did, did someone actually? Thank you. <laughs> um, no, hi, my name is Andrew McGregor. So, in terms of like art and science, and for those of us studying journalism and reporting on it, how does this help people become a better journalist by seeing all kind of multiple sides of the same issue? Yeah, I, I really thank for saying that. I mean, the point is that. If you're a journalist and you're just, say, you're co covering politics and, and you don't see the cultural implications, if you don't put it in historical context, if you don't know, I mean, science, for example, takes place in culture. Politics has to do with science. I'm teaching a whole class this time called Science, Society, and the News. And it's just taking political issues and looking at the science behind them. I could teach three semesters on that. So the, the context, the wider picture, what happens too often is people go to one source and, and see things very narrowly and they don't. Actually, the Victor Navasky, who I mentioned, um, was, played a really big part in my life in this way. Somehow, I never knew how this happened. My first published piece was the cover of the New York Times Sunday Magazine. 30 years later, I found out it was Navasky. But I think the reason was, I wrote it about the political situation in Czechoslovakia. I did a lot of other things before I turned to science. One of them was foreign affairs. Um, and I told it all around jokes, because that's how the Czech people really were surviving and communicating during that very, very dark time uh, when the Prague Spring, for those of you who remember, was squashed, the Russians invaded Czechoslovakia. So, so what the artists, say about political resistance is really important. I mean, artists play a really, really big role. So, so is, is that, does that answer your question? And I think the best journalism always sees, looks at all angles of things, not just one. You will not get a good story. You will be doing, you will just be repeating what the authorities tell you and sending it on to the next step. That's all. So, and yeah, uh huh, because yeah, we only have two minutes. There's no reason to. So um, the general idea of, of your theme of, of this talk has been, you know, categories and the, the importance of breaking out of them. But how do you grapple with the, the paradox that you need these categories to have something to break out of, that you'd only really be able to recognize and see things in new ways if you didn't have them in those categories in the first That's place? That's right. That's right. So to break the rules, whether you're uh, a musician or, or uh, you know, a political reporter, you, or journalist, you have to know what the rules are. So that's really important. So the first thing you need is to, to really, really know your subject. And then, and, then, and then you can break out into other areas when you're comfortable enough. But yeah, you really need expertise in order to break from something. 
I mean, that's one of the things that amazed me is true in every field I know. Writing is that way. All the rules they teach journalism students. Um, all of those rules will be broken or your writing won't be very good. I mean, to some extent, you always have to allow for, well, that file doesn't quite fit here. Well, maybe I need to do this a little differently. Maybe I can look at this story in a slightly different way. It, that kind of thing. Does, it, does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. So, uh-huh. I'm wondering, as far as the business world is concerned, um, which is the world I live in, and it, this applies as well because it, you have silos, you have organizational uh, structures and a lot of rules. Has anyone looked into that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, look at startup companies everywhere who, who did things that were totally against what was done. I mean, Ben and Jerry's or, you know, Patagonia in terms of being interested in the environment and the public good. But, you know, all the online stuff, Google, I mean, all of this stuff came on. People thought they were crazy. And you can probably think of even more ideas. Um, certainly uh, Steve Jobs, Jobs, I always forget how to pronounce it. I mean, these people were, were rebels and, you know, they broke every rule. And that's where you get real creativity is when people break every rule. Who was I just, there was some corporate guy I was just reading about, oh, I can't remember, on a very, very high level who just said, I don't want us to do things. So, oh, God, it was like Exxon or Hewlett Packard. Anyway, it was, anybody know who I'm talking about? Anyway, it, yeah, it absolutely applies to business world. It applies to every world. Parenting is a big one. You know, you read the books and you try to do what they say and you get all hung up on, well, my baby didn't read the book, so, you know, um, there's a disconnect here. And, and you, re re you learn to break those rules because your child is different. It's not like that. The rules are not working anymore. So you have to, you have to throw them away and think, okay, you know, I got this child. I have to meet it on its own terms. Mm -hmm. None really, none really. It's just that most of the rules are about how to stay in the box. That's what most of the rules do. But but no, I think they're. I think it's absolutely the same. Maybe I'm using breaking the rules a little loosely. I mean, I don't mean breaking the law or going against the ethics of your field or you know that kind of thing at all. I just mean. How does breaking the rules, I'm going at that again, and the class that they teach in um, the School of Journalism, Ethics of Journalism, how do you distinguish the difference between the two? And how does a student know when not to break the rules but follow the rules of ethics? That is the most important thing and that's the most difficult thing about, certainly about writing about science because you're always approximating. What you need to know what is essential and important, for example, ethics. That, that's at the core of journalism, what it's about, you know, how to do certain basic things that you really, you really need to know how to do all that. Then you can begin to, you know, sometimes it's just a matter of being sneaky. One of the, uh, I was, uh, where was I writing? I can't remember, but mostly for the New York Times. And I was writing about women's issues and stuff like that. And I, you know, I was going to have a baby. And I, and, and I realized in, in the parenting class that the cesarean rate was like 25%. So I thought, whoa, that's a story. No one believed me at any newspaper. Finally, the New York Daily News said, sure. So I, I interviewed all these obstetricians. And, and of course, I really kind of freaked them out because I was like this. So they, they assumed I was a patient, so that kind of threw him off. But one of them said just in passing that the cesarean rate had been, this was at Columbia Presbyterian, had been 35 one month. So I, I, could, I thought he said it, but I wasn't clear. So I called him back and I, you know, I said, gee, you know, I thought you, which month was, I said, which month was it that you said the number was 35? And he just said it. So, it, it, you know, it was just being a little sneaky in a way or like writing about the po political situation in Czechoslovakia by 
doing that. At the LA Times, I did lots of pieces on um, the mathematics behind fairness, um, all kinds of stuff. When, when cloning was an issue, I did a piece on identity, what it means from a philosophical, biological, religious, et cetera, point of view. I mean, it was, it was so like that. You know, whatever angle everybody else was doing, I just wanted to find another one because it made it more fun. And the LA Times let me do that, and that was because Michael Parks was the editor. Hmm? Yeah, partly. But, but there's certain silly things that people tell you that you really have to learn to ignore. You have to do and get through school, but when you get out in the world, you realize that maybe this isn't the right way. But you gotta do it for the right reasons, for the right thing. It's got to be to get things more right, not let, okay? So it, it, it's making things more accurate and more ethical. And if you need to break some rules to do that, that's what you do. You want to do the best journalism you possibly can. So, well, I thank you all so much for coming and staying and your question. It was really fun.